Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, your source for all things NASCAR history. Presented by Las Vegas Motor Speedway, America's racing showplace. And we walk outside in the parking lot, and we can hear the cars running across the street. <laughs> and he's like, boys, we got the ghost. You were talking earlier also about how Dale was the basically the king of the freebies. And, and you basically got... <laughs> he was a free pass to wherever. <laughs> Dale Earnhardt was a free pass. <laughs> Let me see your stuff. I'm like, what are you talking about? All your tricks. All the things that you do. All the things that you hide from NASCAR. You know, I'm like, we, we don't have any... We got Dale Earnhardt. Richard wouldn't allow us to cheat. He wouldn't allow us to do anything in the gray area. He, you know, he would, you get busted one time and, and it makes you look like we won all these races because we were not doing things right. The day NASCAR and all of us associated in any way with NASCAR forget its past, that's the day we don't have any future. So, 86, 87, 88, 89, uh, Dale had some pretty high-profile run-ins with other drivers. You had uh, D.W. at Richmond. You had Ricky uh, Rudd at, at Wilkesboro in 88 and 89. Um, and you got it. There were, there were some pretty good scrapes there. Yeah. What, what, what was the team's role in all that? Were you, were you his enforcers? Or bodyguards, yeah. or did you just let him take care of that and keep working on the car? So we had a saying back in the day, and I think actually, I'm not sure if Wheel or Chocolate came up with this, but, you know, when you were as dominant as Dale was in 86 and 87, you know, it, it, it's like people got to where either they wanted you to win or they didn't want you to win. And every time something would happen, they get, we would all say, I really didn't see what happened, but I know it wasn't our fault. <laughs> we didn't do anything yeah, wrong. Yeah. But so, um, so we just basically kept our heads down. You know, we we supported Richard and and Dale with whatever. Dale was so there was lots of times when he would call the race from from the driver's seat. Yeah. Kirk would say. Or, or Andy Petrie or Larry McReynolds, he'd say, okay, we're going to stay out. And he would say, no, I'm coming to get four tires. I'm not leaving here until you give me. Yeah, yeah. And he, you know, he's in, he knew. And he's like, well, nobody else is going to pit. Well, you know, he was never wrong. Every time he ever made a call, he, he either got back to where he was or he made it better. It was, he knew the car really well. He really did. So tell me about lunch at the Piccadilly. All right. So <laughs> this was about, I think it was a 88, 89, 90. So we're down in Daytona, and you're down in Daytona. You're there for almost two weeks. Yeah. And Earnhardt had these places he loved to go. So right outside the tunnel, straight across the street in the Volusia Mall was Piccadilly Cafeteria. Piccadilly Cafeteria had everything. You could go over there and you could get whatever you wanted. So he's like, boys, we're going to eat. It's just started raining, so we're going to go across the street. So we all jump in the van. We go and we eat at Piccadilly. And uh, Richard stayed back. Richard didn't go with us. This was before the big coaches and this and that. Richard was always Richard was always doing some business deals and working, working the deals. So after we got through eating um, – He's like, I want to go, I want to get me some CDs for my, actually for the boat. And I can remember, it kind of surprised me because I always thought that he would just be, Dale would just be mostly country music. And, you know, he got some Sheryl Crow CD. He got, yeah. he listened to classical music. He had everything. So he goes in and he buys some t CDs. And then, so we're getting ready to leave and we walk outside in the parking lot and we can hear the cars running across the street. <laughs> And he's like, boys, we got to go. So we get in the van, we fly back through the tunnel, and we, we pull back in the parking lot. And he's like, I'm telling y'all, 
walk in here really, really cool and slow, like we knew they were practicing, not going to yeah. let them see us sweat. Yeah. I'm going to go get my uniform on, and I'll be in the car. So we walked in, and we uncovered the car and got it ready. He walked in and went and cut a couple laps, and Richard never said a word about it, but it was like <laughs> – Dale was big into making sure that nobody ever saw him sweat. It was like it was like we got caught with our pants down that time. But he was like, "Nobody's. We're not going to run in there. We're not going to be in panic mode. We're going to be cool as it can be." <laughs> that was a big deal to him. <laughs> so, nineteen ninety, Daytona five hundred. You know, you know the stories. Well, you know the story yeah. better than I do. You were there. Um, Take me through that last lap. So, you know, you're sitting there and you're just waiting for something to happen. And we'd went down there and we had won the 499. We had won, you know, uh, you know, in the 90s, we didn't have the best cars all the way through the 90s. We, you know, he won every single qualifying yeah. race. Yeah. And it was like, we would go, you know, we'd go testing. We'd go testing at Daytona. We'd go down there for a week and a half. And then if we didn't feel like we were good, we'd go to Talladega and test. I mean, we there was times that we had 30 days of testing, just Speedway stuff, because, because Dale Earnhardt and Richard Childress wanted to win a Daytona 500 so bad. So then coming off, coming off the corner there, and uh, he runs over something, and – blows that tire and it was just absolutely I mean to be that close you can see the start finish line it 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 was the lowest of the low and I can remember him coming in and he says boys it's 365 days before we get a chance to win this race again it's like it, it you actually he wanted it so so bad and then if you really look at the pictures from 98 it was like he had the pressure of thinking that he'd won all these races, done all this stuff, that he wasn't ever going to win the Daytona 500, that it just had haunted him. And to finally get that, that was big, big, big for for RCR, for Richard, and for for Dale especially. It was it, – it just changed him because he never thought – he thought it was um, unobtainable. And he'd done everything that he possibly could do, and then to win it like he won it, and then have all those people come out and knew that he deserved it. I mean, it was, you know, it was it was a special, special, special day. What was it like for you? So it was in shock because we had, you know, that was that was his twentieth try. Yeah, to sit there and just think that okay, you just waiting, waiting, waiting. We'd been in that situation so many times, just waiting for something to happen and for it finally not to and to finally win the race, it will, it gives you a feeling inside that's just absolutely incredible to know that you actually had a lot to do with it. And uh, Now, you're talking about 98. Yeah, I'm talking about 98. Okay, all right. I'm talking about 98. Yeah. Uh, when he, when he, when he, oh, in 90, it was just crushing. Yeah. It was like, what? What do we have to do to win this? I mean, we have done everything. Every detail had worked, and just night and day and hours of every little bitty thing that we could possibly do, and it, and it just something just takes it away from you over and over, and things happen, and and you know it is just deflating. Now, was there ever a point where you were like, okay, we've accomplished everything else? We've won all these championships. We've won all these millions of dollars. Um, basically, done everything you could possibly do in the sport. So maybe this is the one thing that we're not going to be able to do. It, it, that had crossed my mind. It, it had because I know it had crossed because Dale had made a comment. He's like, well, "I guess we're going to win everything but the Daytona 500." Yeah. And then uh, finally, finally, when he won it. It was. I mean, if you look at those pictures of him and Victor Lane, it was it was a major, major, major uh, step in his career. And you know, to sit there and because he was he was pretty much convinced that it wasn't ever going to happen. What were you doing on race day? Uh, were you 
you I know that you went over the wall some yeah. uh, catch can. You also mentioned the fact that you were a signboard holder. Yeah, early on. Now that uh, until Cecil Gordon came, I I, uh, I I did stop sign stuff back in early eighties, and that, then that took a special kind of crazy. Yeah, that did take a special <laughs> because because back then in the eighties, yeah, they were they were. Were, they would fly down pit road. Yeah. That was abs- absolutely fly down pit road. But mostly what I did is is I helped chocolate um, prepare the cans because back in the day, um, you, we still we weighed the cans and made sure that they were full. I ran gas some, and then you put this, the heads on. I mean, it was so much different than it is now. Bleed the cans, get them ready. Um, and the gas cans weren't fast, and the and everything was, you know, the everything was slow. The jacks were fifty eight pounds, and I think yeah. I, I I can remember when we get, when we got our, got our jack that that was forty pounds. That was a major step in the yeah. right direction. And and you know you'd have a twenty two second pit stop, and and you'd still be waiting on fuel. And that was fast back in the day. Yeah. Twenty one second pit stop, I think, set the world record back in yeah. in. The nineties or or, or or whatever, but uh, mostly what I did is I handed a second can of chocolate, and uh, the fuel was the was a big big deal yeah. because you had to be able to hit it. And chocolate was really really good gas man. Chocolate is is and was a lot stronger than what people thought. I mean, he's a big burly, but he could handle those gas cans really good. I mean, he he did a great job. The whole. Will Will in you know and all the tire changers we had our group was was really amazing. Rarely ever practiced, beca- really because we were always working on the car. Wow, I mean the car was what it was all about. And back in the day when you had Dale Earnhardt, you know he he knew how to pass people. When he get to me to pass them, it's not it's not like it is today. That it's today it's easier to pass cars on pit road than it is on the racetrack. We just made sure stuff didn't fall off, and we had really fast pit stops back in the day also, but uh, you didn't look at it like, well, if you lost three positions on pit road or whatever because they did two tires and we did four tires, Earnhardt just always make up for it. You know, you just wanted to make sure that wheel didn't come off or this didn't happen. You you didn't run out of gas or, or whatever. You were talking earlier also about how Dale was the basically the king of the freebies and, and you basically got <laughs> he was a free pass to wherever <laughs> Dale Earnhardt was a free pass we were at it was it was back when Alabama was really 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 big yeah and um, Ralph Seagraves was really tight with Alabama Randy Owen and yeah. the whole group and um, Earnhardt's like hey Alabama's playing at the Ocean Center. Y'all want to go? I'm like, well, we don't have tickets. He's like, we don't need any tickets. He made a call, actually talked to Randy Owen, and he's like, yeah, come on down. And so I actually drove, and we went down there, and I remember Jeff Rutz was Randy's coach driver. Earnhardt's like, he told you everything to do. Okay, turn left here, go here, you sit here. <laughs> you know, yeah. he, he, yeah. he, he directed everything. So we pull up right beside a – Randy Owens' coach, and he gets out, knocks on the door, walks in. Everybody wants his autograph. You know, Randy's, Randy's like, "Hey, Dale, you know, nice to meet you." You know, and this and that, and they actually become really good friends. I mean, uh, Randy Owens spent a lot of time with Dale. So we're driving this black Cadillac, and we're we're inside of Randy's bus, and Jeff Rux is, he is Randy's. Uh, caretaker, keeper, whatever you want to call it. He made sure he had everything that he needed. And Earnhardt kept, new Cadillac had a push button. He kept blowing the horn on the phone and, I mean, blowing the horn on the car. So so Jeff would go out of the bus, go see who was blowing the horn and get back up in the bus. About the time he gets situated, Earnhardt blow the horn again. Jeff would go back out. I mean, he did it to him like (laughs) 10 times. And then he comes in and he goes, are you doing that? And he goes, I might be. And I was like, everybody just like, it embarrassed Jeff. Per, yeah. Jeff. Yeah. But, but I'm going to tell you though, I can remember that we were at Indy and they're like, Hey, George Strait wants to meet you. Uh, 
George I'll, Strait wants to meet you. Yeah, George Strait wants to meet no, you. Well, bring him, bring him on, <laughs> bring him on over, bring yeah. him on over. You know, yeah. it, it's, it's, it, it's like wherever, whatever. All these people were Dale Earnhardt fans. Yeah. You could have, I can remember Will Lynn saying this, and it's very true. You could have the nicest suit, the best clothes, or whatever. If you were wearing that good wrench shirt, it's better than anything that you I mean, people <laughs> would buy your dinner, people yeah. would ask you to do stuff. I mean, we went deep sea fishing. We went we did everything you could possibly do. And because people, of that good wrench shirt. Because, okay. because of yeah. because of Richard Childress Race and the Good Wrench stuff and Dale Earnhardt and this and that, it was you know, it, it didn't matter what it was. I mean, uh, motocross and her heart's like I know somebody you know he 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 had connections everywhere we went it was really amazing what's the coolest thing that you got to do as a result of that good ranch uniform so I, we did there's there's just lots and lots and and lots of neat things that we got to do um, probably the coolest thing is is early on um, me and Mike Dillon or in Phoenix, Arizona, one of the very first races at Phoenix. And uh, these, we're going to eat, and there's big, big Coliseum there in downtown. And he's like, I wonder what all these people are doing. So he saw a sign, Eagles, live tonight, <clears throat> sold out. So Dylan's like, let's go see if we can get in. I'm like, it's sold out, Mike. And he goes, well, let's just go talk to him. So we're driving black Cadillac again. So we pull up in limo parking. Me and Mike get out. So we go to the go to the special VIP. Mike is he's really smooth. <laughs> so he goes up <laughs> and he says, "Hey, uh, need to pick up our VIP passes. It's Mike Dillon and Danny Lawrence, and uh, he's got the RCR shirt on and this and that." And the, the guy's like, I saw those. And he's looking through, and he's like, I don't see anything for you guys. He goes, hold on just a minute. And he calls somebody, and he goes, I, I'm i pretty sure that I might have given them to the wrong person. Yeah. So they send this guy out, and he's like, so y'all with RCR? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, all right, come with me. So <laughs> he carries, he said, if y'all don't mind, this thing is sold out. Yeah. I'm going to place y'all on the edge of the stage <laughs> where you can just look across and see. Yeah. And so I hope that's okay. I would we'll get you guys a couple chairs. I'm yeah. like, like, that'll be all right. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> so they put us on the corner of the stage for the Eagles. It was absolutely incredible. So we're sitting there. Mike meets people everywhere. So we... He's talking to the drummer. He's, ta- I mean, he's talking to everybody. He's talking to the roadies. So we get the whole list of songs. I think Mike's might still have that. And he's like, they're going to do two encores, and when they play Hotel California, that's the last song. This place is going to be crazy to get out of. So we watched the whole show, and then right when they started playing Hotel California, we left. <laughs> Pulled out of there, didn't I mean they brought us drinks, they brought us food, they brought us it was it was absolutely, absolutely uh incredible. I mean, but there's so many stories like you that. You left during Hotel Cal uh, You we, left we li- during Hotel Cal. We li- we left <laughs> listening to it, but we got to the car before it was over with. <laughs> but so it, so I mean there's so so many neat yeah. things that, that yeah. you know, we met the president and and uh one of the one of the things I can't I can't ever forget is is they're they're talking about okay going to build Texas Motor Speedway. So they get the thing built and it's not it's not ready. We're going to go do a tire test. So we go down there with Earnhardt. We do this tire test, and Earnhardt's like, "You guys got any decent clothes?" I'm like, yeah, we we you know, we're going to eat with Ross Perot Jr. tonight. I'm like, okay. So we go to this place called Three Forks to eat, and we're in this special little room, and it's Richard and Earnhardt, all of us. Yeah. And that was the first time I had ever been around a politician. And I'm going to tell you, Ross Perot impressed me. So he sits there, 
and he gets everybody's name. And he remembers everybody's name. And as he's talking, he incorporated every person in the conversation. He would say, David, you know, where are you from? You know, and this and that. Well, I had some people, you know, and he asked me, you know, so you're the engine guy. And he's like, that must be. And by the time we got through with that, I was like, that. He is absolutely brilliant. I mean, he worked the room, and, you know, you sit there and you see Richard and you see Dale, how they how they could fit in with sophisticated – I mean, it was a, he's very, very yeah. intelligent. Yeah. Or or we could just, you know, be with the country folks. I mean, it was, it was amazing, and that's why people love Dale Earnhardt so much. He was the people's champion because of where he came from and how he did it. Uh, I think that's why so many people loved him. Did you ever see Dale starstruck by somebody else? No, never did. Okay. He, 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 there's a couple things I can remember him saying, I learned from Richard Petty that my signature matters, that these people are, come to get my autograph, I need to be able to write it to where they know it's my autograph. And if you look at everybody's autograph, you look at Richard Petty's autograph and you look at Dale Earnhardt's autograph, you know who it is. Yeah. A lot of these guys, you don't have a clue who right. it is. And he paid attention to a lot of stuff. He was, um, Dale was really, really intelligent when it came to, to stuff like that. There's so many things that we could talk about. I mean, um, hopefully Jeff Gordon won't get upset for me saying this, but back when we were racing Jeff Gordon and, you know, back and forth for the championship, you know, Andy Petrie and Ray Everham, they they would go back and forth. They knew what, what setups each other had. Yeah. And Dale and Jeff Gordon, you know, on the racetrack, you know, they were doing all this drinking milk and this and that. They had, they had property together. They bought land together, and nobody knew it. I mean, they 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 put on a show for the fans. Yeah, and I mean, they, on the racetrack, they wanted to outrun each other, but they also wanted to make it good. Yeah. Dale was brilliant at all that stuff. He would come in the racetrack, and he would go, "Guys, I need y'all to wear these hats. We've we've got." 200 dozen and they're not selling and he would wear one and we would wear yeah. one and then in about two weeks later he'd go all those hats are grown so all it would take yeah. was the team and him to wear these hats so some of these hats that that you'd see him wear it was like they're i can't believe you get rid of them but people would <laughs> yeah. people would i mean he 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 would work that stuff he knew he knew how to do it he was he was businessman so you win the championship uh, in 90 and 91, but in 92, you hit a roadblock. What happened? Tires. Tires Tire. was a whole, whole lot of it with, with the tires. We could, he couldn't get the feel for the car. He, everywhere, every week we struggled, you know, it, it, it would, you know, he, he was a big feel guy and they, they had changed the tires and it, it took him a little while to be able to, to figure out, you know, and, and, you know it's so crazy when when you're sitting there like in '87 and you're like, how do you how do you win all those races? And you're actually working way harder when you're not. Yeah. Then it, everything just kind of lines up, and you, you go, "What did y'all What did y'all change? We didn't change anything." Yeah. You know. You know the crazy thing is, I can remember that when Andy Petrie came, he's like. All right, I'm here. I'm going to be here for, you know, I got a two-year deal. Let me see your stuff. I'm like, what are you talking about? All your tricks, all the things that you do, all the things that you hide from NASCAR. You know, I'm like, we we don't have any. We got Dale Earnhardt. We don't need all. Give me, show me how you take lead out or how you have offset wheels or what you do to the tires or all. I'm like, we don't, we don't do none of that. So you're telling me that you don't like nope. 
And Andy's like, well, except for the long car that you couldn't yeah. get under the car cover. But it did pass inspection. <laughs> uh, it did. It did pass inspection. Okay. Okay. All right. I yeah. got you. Yeah. So, That's an important distinction. Yeah, yes. 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 <laughs> so so we had no, we had no tricks. We never put anything in the fuel. We never cheated the tires up. We never. You know, we didn't. We didn't take lead out of the car. We didn't have anything that we went through inspection and change. We didn't do any of that. We never did. Never had to. And, you know, after you talk to people, everybody else was. So Kurt left at the end of 94, and as you've mentioned, uh, Andy did come on board in 93. How big of a difference was that? It was big. It was, it was big. So How difficult was it? It was it – was, it was, you know, Andy was a racer, which, which was really good. So we have these things at the shop. Um, actually, we have one tomorrow called All, it's All Access, to where we're trying to not just uh, give tours to people, but we're trying to educate people on the history and how things are today. So this All Access Pass is through the museum. I think we have 25 people tomorrow morning at 830. So they come in and they they buy a ticket. And uh, like tomorrow, me and Mike Dillon will show them through the museum. And then they get to see a pit stop. And then we take them and show them the new car. And then they get to go to the engine shop. It's behind the scenes tour. And one of the great things to do on this tour is is when you go in the museum, uh, when Andy first got there, he's like, where's your surface plate at? Like, we don't have surf plate. Where do you set the cars up at? Out here in, in the middle of the floor, we have assembly area on both sides. We set them up in the middle of the floor. Like, y'all, you don't have, like, nope. Well, we got to get a surface plate. So we come, and they cut a big hole in the floor, and they put this surface plate in. And then Richard walks in and goes, it's, it's not level. It's two <laughs> inches off on the back yeah. side, and the front side's a little low. I'm like, no, the surface plate's completely level. The floor's off. <laughs> and that's where we that's where we set all these cars up. But it took us a little while with all of our setups yeah. to be able to compensate from that. But and Andy uh brought us into the new age. You know, it was like we were setting the cars up on feed scales. We'd have four feed scales, you know, with the little bar yeah. that you put yeah. across there yeah. and then, and you'd write all the weights down and we got all computerized and because we were old school. Yeah. We were very, very old school. And Andy brought a lot of that stuff, you know, into us. And it, it's so crazy. Is now, did we, he bring that to you with you guys kicking and screaming? Or were you? Will kicked and screamed a little bit. <laughs> uh, and uh, Because, you know, Will was, Will was right there on top of it. Um, but we knew we needed to be better. Yeah. And, you know, which all, all, that, all that stuff did you know it did help us get better and uh, we would go do tests and stuff and um andy was really big on he brought the uh, our up to our standards we'd figure out something from a test and he would like don't touch those fenders don't you know the car set and before we didn't pay as much attention to that kind of stuff. Kirk did, but yeah. most of the guy, most of the guys didn't, and, and that that helped our consistency. You know, it it did it did definitely helped us. What did that mean to you? Nineteen ninety four, Dale wins his seventh ch- championship. What did that mean to you to be a part of that? Well, so the thing was, is I, I call it whatever you want to call it. We. We were the champions, but we felt like we should have won a lot more races, and we felt like that we should have led more laps, and we felt like we always wanted more. Yeah. And um, as soon as we won that, we we went to we got to win we got to win the most. We got to win eight. We got to got to we got to work really hard and figure out how we can win eight. That's immediately what we what you know what we were looking for. How frustrating did it become when you didn't get that eight championship? It, very, very, very frustrating because we had a lot of pressure on us. I mean, it was like every year somebody would turn out to be really good. You know, we would be racing somebody, and and 
um, so many things were out of your control, you know, things that would happen here and there. And, and um, you know, it, 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 when you lose your way in this race and stuff, you know, you need, and you really try to work hard to figure it out and you're doing all you can do, um, it's, it's like we always give 100%. We always have – we have this saying at RCR that, that we have part-time people, we have full-time people, and we have all the time. The all the time people were the road people that, you know, lay in bed at night and figure out how to try, try to be better on your part of it and how to, how to, how to be the best that you can be. We never, we never took pictures of other people's cars. We never, we just worked on what, what Dale said he needed. And, you know, even Kevin. And we tried to do our own deal. I mean, we are, we're away from everybody else. Our shop is not near anybody else's. We rarely changed any employees. Most of our guys stayed with us for years and years and years. And if they if they if they left us, they didn't. They weren't in racing usually. So uh, that helped us and hurt us. They, you know, people wouldn't. People in the Charlotte area would get on to something that we wouldn't know about. And everybody that goes to lunch yeah. together yeah. or switch teams, they would have all the same stuff. You know. There's a few things that happened. I, I, there used to be a piece inside the manifold that that was movable, and uh, when NASCAR busted everybody with it, we won three races right after that because Richard wouldn't allow us to cheat. He wouldn't allow us to do anything in the gray area. I mean, you know, he would. You get busted one time, and and it makes it look like we won all these races because we were not doing things right. Yeah. Um, we tried to do everything the right way, every way that that we we could, 